I first, I just, we're here to celebrate Shay Milder and this just incredible <laughs> We really, you know, this is a radical body of work that was last shown this entirety in New York in 1964 at Martha Jackson Gallery. Jesus. And uh, through a lot of um, blood, sweat, and tears, we got it all back together in this, our space on Great Chunk Street, which I think is in the true spirit of who Jay is and what he represents in the downtown New York scene. And, uh, and, and with that, we were able to put together this wonderful panel with my good friend Carla McCormick, who has always been uh, a champion of the gallery and a champion of my vision to try to tell stories in New York that need to be told. And Jay is no better example than any story that I want to tell in New York. So thank you for being here this evening. And um, and I'm going to go ahead and uh, let Carlo make the introductions from here. And so cool. thank you, Carlo, for doing this. this yeah. Thank so, you, Eric. Yeah. And uh, thanks to everyone at the gallery who uh, uh, helped so much and all of you for coming. But really, uh, I just really want to uh, thank these three uh, people here. Uh, I'll go from the far end, Henry Chalfant, Mimi Gross, and Chris Ellis, uh, who goes by the name Days, is an artist. Uh, this is, you know, for me it's a treat because I'm talking to three artists I really adore uh, about a subject I'm a little too obsessed with, this notion of where art and subways might meet. And, uh, and really, uh, it's an honor to do it uh, for Jay. And I thought, just to start it off a bit, Mimi Gross has known Jay for, uh, I think, a, a number of years, we can say. They, they grew up together. Uh, and I thought maybe, uh, since you understand his work, and I thought maybe you could say a few words about, about what he's doing with this series and, and put it all in context for us for a bit. You don't mind, do you? The start? Yeah, just to start, to say a few words on. I met Jay in 1958, mm -hmm. and he picked me up in Provincetown. I was coming from the beach on my bicycle, and he was painting on this kind of unwieldy balcony with a great big painting. He had basically just arrived there, right? Anyway, that was the beginning of our wonderful long friendship. We've known each other all this time. I know his children since before they were born, and his grandchildren before they were born, everybody. And so the love is genuine, and the work is very genuine. These paintings, they just blow your mind. They're fantastic. So great to see them again. But then he's been through vast changes over all these different years, always related to freedom and freshness, but definitely huge changes. And what else is no, that? No, that's, that's wonderful. Thanks. I just wanted to, you know, sorry to put you on the spot. I'm not on the spot because I'm here. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you think you're the captive audience. This is the captive audience. Uh, I think, uh, so, uh, what I wanted to, to try to engage all of you in is is uh, how the subway can be uh, an incredibly inspiring uh, place of visual culture for artists. And, uh, and, and I think what's interesting is we have a, three very different gazes here on it. Uh, Henry, uh, you capture like the lightning in the bottle of a kind of golden age of, uh, of graffiti on the trains as they're kind of going through stations. Uh, Mimi's been, uh, since she said since she started uh, at seven years old, uh, making drawings in the subway. And uh, she sent me one the other day, a JPEG of one, which was people wearing masks. So you know she's still doing it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and then uh, Chris, you, you, I guess you started with more of an exploratory uh, uh, relationship to the, uh, the underground, to the subterranean world. Uh, you worked so much on trains, did some amazing uh, work, uh, which Henry captured along with so many other people. But then I was really interested in having you up here because uh, so much of the subway exists as a kind of mythic place of memory for you. Sorry for that, that was the weird introduction. Hope I didn't take too much time. Uh, but maybe you can each talk about what I just said about you, but like how, how it engaged you in that way. Do you want to you start? 
Chris? Um, well, in terms of my, my own work, I was, I'm always looking at New York as a kind of muse. And, uh, and I feel that, you know, I can find inspiration, you know, it's weird where, where you can find it. So as far as my subway paintings go, um, they came about thinking about my, my daily commute, um, going to my studio, picking up my kids from school and doing all this stuff. And, um, you know, the, the, the subways used to be, uh, a lot more exciting for me, you know? I mean, yeah, when absolutely. I when I when I got on the subways in say like 1980, it was like reading this urban newspaper and I was always looking for my name or someone else's name and I was always kind of amazed by the work that was was being produced. Now, you know, that all all that is subtracted, I'm kind of dealing with it the way a lot of everyday strap hangers deal with it, you know, you're subways that are late or not on time, or this or that. So I wanted to kind of make something out of that, you know, and make paintings that kind of deal with that commute. Yeah. Yeah, you, you, you captured that, but also the yards and stuff. But maybe, <clears throat> um, uh, I have you've been such a people watcher. I mean, I guess if I'm talking about different gazes, it's like, not all of us like make eye, make eye contact on the subway. You know? Well, like nobody does anymore. Right. Everybody's covered in a mask and looking down at their phones. Probably nine out of ten people are on phones. Used to be really sexy, like you looked up and people looked at you, and it was like a genuine electricity in the subway, just like you're saying. It was electric because people liked looking at each other. You know, it wasn't personal; it just was friendly. And, and the, of course, the variety of people is nowhere in the world is like New York. And when you travel and come back to New York, you just, it's just amazing to see, like in one subway car, how varied the humans yeah. are. Different languages. <laughs> different languages, different, every single type of character. Yeah. And, uh, and we'll return to all this stuff, but maybe uh, Henry, uh, because you really did get that lightning in the bottle and you actually saw something. So uh, how did that kind of discovery and then the, the kind of the scope of, of this incredible project of documentation you do? Uh, how did that... Well, um, I came to New York to, to be an artist um, in 1973. And uh, it, um, in fact, I, I was a sculptor and then I became part of the Sculptors Guild and there I met Mimi's dad. Heim Gross, who was a, you know, it's incredibly... Another subway rider. And another subway rider. Deep in his yeah. 80s, he was on yeah. the subway. Yeah, bravo. Yeah. So, um, I was, from as an outsider, I was blown away by this wonderful variety of people and this exuberance and craziness which is on the subway and, and these paintings look like it. And I was uh, taken by that sort of adolescent rebellion expression and interested in it and started following the, the, the tags and the names and thinking, I wish I could take pictures of these beautiful pieces and I was watching them evolve. But I was always inside and it wasn't until I ventured into the outer boroughs and into the elevated trains that I said, aha, I can take pictures. And that's how I that's how I began and uh, you know to try to capture and it became a game um, you know it was like like hunting or fishing I had to get up every day and, and get up early so that I could catch something not kill it yeah. but catch it it disappear and, the next day yeah and, 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 and it's ephemeral so if you didn't get it sometimes you just didn't get it and so that started me on this project for it must have been almost 10 years of of capturing the trains. Uh, and, and, and the art on them. It's, uh, well, yeah, so, exactly. Yeah, I'm not yeah, a train yeah. buff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're no. not a quite a train <laughs> I put train spotter in the title of this thing, but you kind of like, I just wanted to use that word. Yeah. Irvin Welsh is a friend, <laughs> and art. I just kind of like every time I can yeah. like, you know, okay. reference that, I, I like art to. on the trains. But uh, I'd like to get to you, uh, each of you a bit about, maybe just you continue, Henry, and then everyone else. There's a little bit of process involved. Uh, it's, you know, maybe like plein air painting or something, but you had to do something because photography, I think, was a little more complicated then than mm -hmm. it is now. 
but you had to find a way to get it all kind of in one frame and splice it. You can explain that, and I would like everyone yeah. to talk a bit about well, it. Yeah, I'll try to be brief about it. I, I was wondering how I was going to, how am I going to catch these? And, and uh, I was riding the train on a weekend when they parked the, on the third rail in the middle trains between the stations because they don't use so many. And I was riding up and I saw this in, incredible two-car, double car of Lee Quinones, which was a Merry Christmas with Santa Clauses and reindeer and everything on it. And um, I said, oh my God, I've got to get that. But it was in between two stations, Intervale and Prospect in the Bronx. And how am I going to get that? Well, I waited till one train had passed into the station. I thought, well, now I have time to run out there on the catwalk and take pictures. So I did that. And it, of course, it was so close. And I had a 50 millimeter lens. So I took basically 10 or 12 pictures of those two cars, one after the other, walking along the, the catwalk. And that was the first one I did. And then that was the clue that if I wanted to take pictures, I could do it from the stations and just wait till the other train came down while I was on the uptown side and take pictures. And by then, for one car, you could do it in five shots. So that's how, that was my process. And I would, you know, splice them together. At this is before Photoshop. <laughs> it was before Photoshop and before, before, you know, and of course the wide angle lens was a fisheye, so right. it didn't look good. And, uh, you know, there was a wide alux, which was very expensive and to use that, I didn't want to do that. So I spliced them together and, uh, that's how, that's how, that was my process. Sorry to make you geek out. I, I'm kind of, I always like wanted to get that full story. We got it. Um, Mimi, that's, uh, you're doing, you're the one, I guess, doing the planet airplane. You're actually, these are in time. You're, and uh, people last, I don't know, a stop or two or maybe five, I don't know. So you're trying to capture people in the moment in this kind of, you know, to tell us a little bit about, about it if you've ever gotten in trouble or anything. Yes. Oh, you have. I had one policeman rip up my sketchbook. Oh, wow. On the path, on the path yeah. train, it wasn't. Oh, no. Yes. That's what you get for taking the path. I've gotten into trouble, like, why didn't you tell me you can't draw me? You know, people mm -hmm. got mad. Yeah. But that's very rare. Mm -hmm. Mainly people are very pleased to be drawn. Yeah. But I, I'd like to add that when I was in high school, I did a big subway painting that is in the school still. And then when I got older and was married, we did a life-size subway yeah, that you could walk is, through and you could sit I down. And there'll be a lot of people here with memories of ruckus Manhattan. Right. Uh, they, they not uh, you not only created the subway, but you kind of created 14th Street Station. And it, it is really like uh, including the token booth and a couple naked yeah. people. Yeah, it was like it was the rowdy New York. We, you know. And, when Chris, we were copying, <laughs> the bones, uh, we were like, copying Chris's uh, graffiti. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then so I, I guess for for you, uh, Days, uh, I guess I want both things. Like first of all, like you know, tell us some stories about the yards. Now, but talk about like. Because uh, it w it wasn't easy access always to work on trains. Well, I'll tell you I'll tell you how I met Henry. How about oh, that? there we go. Um, so That's a good one. Uh, I met Henry about 1977, and you know it was myself, Crash, Kel, his brother Mayor, and Knack, and we were the first writers really to meet you. Yep. You know, and you were taking pictures at Intervale Avenue. And that Intervale Avenue is in the Bronx, and it's a good station to take photos because you can catch work on the uptown or downtown side. Um, so prior to meeting Henry, we kind of took our own little photos with 110 cameras or 126 cameras that were really not that great. So I think Kel met you first, mm -hmm. and he was like, oh, yo, I met this guy. I don't know if he's a cop, I don't know what, but he said, you know, he's been taking photos of trains and he has a studio down, you know, in Soho and, uh, and uh, yeah, we should come check out his flicks. I think he has some of our stuff. So we were kind of thinking about it, you know, I mean, Crash and I like, well, who's this guy? Who's, why is anyone interested besides us in taking these kind of photos? So yeah, we took a chance and we, we went to your studio at night 
And um, we were kind of blown away by the portfolios of photos of work that you already had. And I guess by 1977, you had been shooting maybe for a couple of years already by that point. I, I shot for a couple of years yeah, before I met anybody. Before you met anybody. Yeah. So, you know, we, we uh, I think, brought some, some black books, some sketchbooks mm -hmm. to show you and everything. And, you know, it was just this kind of an incredible moment seeing, you know, the subway pieces in 35 millimeter format. Did it feel like a ratification or something? It, yeah, it was just incredible because prior to that, like I said, it was just like little it's tiny invisible. snapshots mm -hmm. that we yeah. took on an angle. You know, on an this. angle. They're all horrible. completely non non professional at all. But um, but after that, that was kind of the birthplace of a, of a long um, friendship. Yep. And that must have been, you know, not just with Chris uh, or the first batch you meet, but probably over time, the, it, it was, you had to earn people's trust. And then once you became kind of like the, you, know, you and Martha were like the eyes of the community, people would call you up and say, I just did something, right? Sure. You'd, you'd have to kind of race like yeah. a fireman to catch it. Yeah, I would get on my answering machine messages every morning that they'd done something on such and such a line, and they knew my preferences. They knew the lines I liked, and they knew <laughs> they knew that I if, transfer it's trade on the, and if it's on the morning side or the or the afternoon side, which yeah, was yeah. crucial help for me to get it. So then I would run up and and hopefully come you know catch it because it was it was nip and tuck. You didn't always catch it. Did you, you know, get if you copies of the pictures? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. we have copies. And uh, and uh, Eric Firestone Gallery has shown. Of Henry's work, and so they got a really nice art. Unless you've yanked it back from them, but I think they should have some good ones. <laughs> they have <laughs> access to them. Yeah. Uh, oh, by the way, uh, just because I'm s such a weird guy, uh, I really have all, uh, so many images of subways and art. And basically, so we've got Henry, Mimi, and, and Chris's work up here, but then I supplement it with like 50 images from the knots of the 90s, so basically throughout the 20th century, and it's a shocking list of some of the most kind of famous artists uh, of that era, uh, like Rothko, or people you wouldn't necessarily expect to, to be painting about the subways then. Um, and so, okay, yeah, uh, uh, that does, you know, bring up why it would be a continued fascination, and do you, any of you have, I mean, Mimi, were you aware of like this kind of pantheon of 20th century American art about the subway and stuff uh, when you started? Or no, yeah, not particularly. It's, it's Just had a long trip every day. So yeah, yeah. And how about you? You probably didn't know, it. Chris. You were always like more aware of like Ashcan School of John Sloan's in this thing. You know, yeah, like I, that. I was aware of like like Reginald Marsh, Reginald and, Marsh, um, and this, yeah. Hopper, Absolutely. and John Sloan. I, I was aware of like the way that they kind of captured New York and, and not in a really romantic eye either. You know, they were kind of capturing the underbelly of New York too. And I kind of, I felt and still feel kind of an affinity to that. Mm -hmm. Me too. Uh, Reginald Marsh was principal influence for Ruckus Manhattan. Oh, that makes so much <coughs> sense. That's yeah. great. Very much so. And Rayfield Sawyer was my other there's father. A, there's a there's a Raphael Sawyer. He, he and my well. father were best friends forever, wow. and he because he was and a him painter. And his brother, right? He, Moses, yeah. his Moses. twin brother. Amazing artist. So a lot, when I you know just to put me on the age spectrum here, when I was growing up, they were all pretty much being eradicated from art history That's right. because it was incredibly inconvenient that they were doing kind of uh, a body, contemporary, low-life, urban society, which kind of showed us warts and all, and it was much more convenient to go for things like abstract expressionism, which, you know, bespoke our freedom instead, you well, know. It was apolitical. Yeah, exactly. Um, okay, uh, I, this is a weird one, and I'm gonna open up to questions maybe after this, because it's always good to, what about Jay? He should tell us. This. Jay, can you do? You, do you feel like talking, saying a little bit about how you feel about the, you know, how the subway uh, runners came about and, and your relationship to the subway? Do you want to say anything about that? Well, uh, I, um, I have myself and Martha Jackson Gallery, which was uh, pretty important in the 60s. Uh, they had the ABC News company. 
Love it. Mm. I lived way uptown, so if he had to take me home from way downtown, got to that's find what, That's when you're looking for like the A train or something? Could you get the express? The C. The C. The C. Oh, the C. C. Yeah. <laughs> slow ride. Slow that's ride. A slow ride. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, I, you know, Jay, I'm really glad you, you, uh, you brought up this idea of like how it might have resonated with some mayhem at the time. Because uh, I think. Uh, especially because of the shooting on the end line out in Brooklyn, uh, but rising crime and also really rising cri uh, major crisis in mental health. Be you know, uh, the subways, are, its preciousness is, is kind of infused with a, a particular precarity now. And like, there was an incredible, you know, big thing in the New York Times today about this, and the New Yorker had a big thing, but we have this odd compact, a social kind of, Thing that we all like you know we agree to go underground with a lot of people all at once you know especially the people stuck doing rush hour and and yet somehow we've always kind of you know sometimes you end up with a smelly armpit in your face or or you know whatever uh someone who wants to rub against you untowardly but basically we uh we've done really well there and i think a lot of people now are feeling fear again like yeah. maybe existed in the 70s and maybe we can talk about uh, how the subway is changing in this way. I can, I can say that when I came in 73, the reputation of New York was pretty scary. And so you felt trepidation in coming. And once you're here, you feel comfortable, mostly. But um, at that time, you know, the, the art expression, one of the was Ruckus Manhattan was something I went to over and over again. Yeah. Because it, it represented for me what I loved about the feeling of New York, that, that That's exuberance cool. and, and looniness and variety of people riding the subways, that it, it expressed it so well. And that was one of the things that made me love New York. Yeah. And, uh, but you wanted me to, you wanted to go fast forward to now? Yeah, <laughs> it was not too grim. It's a long time yeah. ago. It, it's, you, feel, you feel a little more coming back like that, given, you know, as you mentioned, the, the mental health situation and uh, the homelessness. Um, there's really wild sort of rides on the train now and uh, in sharing the car with people just living there. Yeah. So. Yeah, for sure. Anyone want to add to that or anything, <laughs> or does that say it all? I mean, I think that kind of is, is a good dis description of it. You know, for, my, for myself, before, say, 1976, you know, my world on the subways was kind of limited to Brooklyn, you know, and it wasn't until um, about 1976 and when I started kind of painting trains, when I really started to city. explore the rest of New York, you know, at every odd hour, you know, so I saw a lot of things kind of happening during that time. But, you know, I wasn't really too frightened because I felt like I could blend into the subway somehow, you know, in a way that I felt almost like invisible, you know, at one, two in the morning, you know. But now it's, it's different, you know. I think that, you know, with uh, people dealing with homelessness and, and mental health issues, it's become way more unpredictable and anything can happen not just at one or two in the morning but you know when you're going to school or work yeah yeah um. but i want to bring up that as a little girl my mother let me take the subway myself i was taking these uh 
classes at the Museum of Modern Art. They had some experimental classes, which meant they gave you paint and paper, and that was it. <laughs> Perfect. And I would take three trains to get there, and I went by myself, whereas when my granddaughters were little and my daughter was little, they didn't ride by themselves. Things definitely were different from yeah. the 40s and 50s. Yeah. It suddenly um, became less safe. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. I, it's strange because you always uh, be careful what you wish for. I, I remember at certain points like thinking, especially since all the people I knew who had hated graffiti now didn't even mind that their subway cars were just basically filled with ads. And it's like, they hated graffiti. I go, yeah, what about those, the ads? And they'd be like, I just ignore them. It's like, well, why couldn't you ignore the graffiti <laughs> creeps? But you know, so it's like, it feels like a compromise, but you know, uh, but I do remember thinking that I kind of wish things would get a little more scary again, but you know, careful what but you wish for. They were insane yeah. the way they kept trying to wash the graffiti. Oh, oh the that buff was, was horrible. It looked so ugly also. It's so it stupid. ruined the train car. Yeah. Everything rotted. It's the the dumbest sphere. thing about the city was... <laughs> Most of our wars it. are pretty dumb. Uh, can I open it up to some uh, questions so I'm not too much of a hog? Provocative questions. Yeah. Uh, give, let's go ahead, man. Hey, oh, give us a... Oh, all right, yeah. Uh, so, uh, Henry, so uh, my friend Paul Weston of the Videograph of Cheerings, how did you run into him and this whole video thing he was doing, videotaping the graffiti, right? Yeah. And then he comes to work for you and then the whole movie experience, so maybe you can do it in a little capsule, like how you got well, it, to... Uh, it's like, um, you know, what Dave was talking about. I had, I had a studio downtown and I had albums full of graffiti pictures and word got out. And so people that I didn't know started to, to show up. That's cool. and, and among whom was Carl Weston, who was at the time a kid. He was, you know, a teenager. And he knocked on my door and he came in and, and looked at the pictures like everyone else. And we just, we became friends. And so um, he got interested in, in um, you know, it was, it was like the late 80s. And I had already made Style Wars with Tony Silver. And so there was this idea of making film. And, and Carl picked up his, a video camera and he started to, to shoot himself. Trains and people doing walls and interviewing people. Um, he actually, he wasn't working for me, except later on <clears throat> as, a, as a camera person. But he just started out himself. Okay, so you got inspiration from your books as I, well as yes, I, I think I think it's fair to say yes. Yeah, yeah. It, it, you know, you created the meme that spread this thing around the world. Yeah. <laughs> but I have Coke to game. say, I have to say, in you know, days mentioning that time that we met, that it introduced me to graffiti writers. Uh, I had been taking pictures for a couple of years, and I was immensely curious to meet one, mm. and um, it was very difficult because they were cagey about this guy two or three times their age um, taking pictures. Yeah, what, yeah. what for? Yeah, <laughs> so yeah. nobody approached me. Yeah, 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 you know, yeah. Until uh, I think it actually was um, your guy. He said, he said I'm Daisy's cousin. Nah. Nah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, he was the first one. <laughs> well, right. once you're underground, you really don't want to get exposed. Of course, of course, <laughs> except you do. <laughs> well said, well said, beautiful. That's the wisdom. How about another question? Go ahead, bro. Yeah, question for days. I've always been super curious about like some of the spy craft involved in actually getting to the trains. Pain of like, were you hopping fences like at two in the morning? You have to leave by six in the morning. Sometimes, so sometimes curious, not. Like, if there was like a routine you had with like four people that would show up at once with you. You know. You always change your uh, your path. Sometimes it's two in the morning. Sometimes it's twelve o'clock in the day. It's it just depends on the place, you know. Any good serial killer need, tells you you need to change your mo. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, how about someone else? Yeah, Coast TBS for Feedy Artists. Um, Dave, this question is for you. Um, I watch your work. Early in my day, in the 80s, I saw you, Crash, Kel, Mayor, all you guys, and I always looked up to you guys. 
Thank you. And, you know, my career got cut off because I made a lot of bad choices. You know, finally I'm back and I'm doing exhibitions. But my question to you is NFTs. Yes. You're a lot of buzz about NFTs and that. Yikes. So it's not good thing, but art in general yes. is going in that direction. What are your thoughts on that? Well, it's something that, you know, um, when I first started hearing about it, I, you know, probably like a lot of other people, I, it was explained to me and I was like, what? <laughs> you know, um, you know um, I think it's developing into a medium just like oil painting or, or other things, or this kind of like digital medium. Uh, as far as my own participation in that, I'm not against it, but I, I don't know enough about it, you know. But in, in general, I like things that are more tangible. And if they're not really tangible, then, you know, I really want to know more about it. And well, let me add something to that, because I, I think what uh, you three have in common is an incredible generosity. Uh, and I think certainly anyone who makes work for the people outside the market where there's no remuneration, that's, that's really like, I don't know why we would criminalize that, that's, that's generosity. Um, but, you know, Mimi, like we mentioned Rutgers Manhattan, there's so much, you, Mimi helped, you know, in so many ways in the Times Square show, which defined, you know, Chris and my generation, you know, you, your work is all about giving and Henry, you know, what you, what you gave to like two generations of artists is like a record and, and, and you know and a posterity they never so nfts don't strike me as a particularly generous medium and i think that's maybe the politics behind that like we'd be happier to like do t-shirts that kids could afford and yeah. never, you know, get some use out of that's i don't know sure. i shouldn't speak for everyone but i think that's there, there's a difference there but i love answering for artists <laughs> uh, any other questions for them? I mean, me. Yeah. But anyone? We got a few more, maybe. Yeah, go ahead. Um, you touched on this a little bit, but um, there was the subway shooting in Brooklyn a couple of weeks ago. Uh, just maybe the night before last, somebody else was shot in Brooklyn, and uh, maybe three or four days ago, there were a couple of French graffiti writers that were in a tunnel <laughs> out in Brooklyn, and they got hit by a train. With all this stuff happening. Do we, I mean, is the days of the beautiful people going out and doing beauty and doing stuff in the subway like that, is that gone? And is that, has the subway now become a, a danger zone? Is this, this for me? For um, it's still happening. It's just not running. That's the difference. And part of the whole attraction for me, you know, back in the day is like, doing a piece and putting it out in the world. And then you never know when you're gonna see it again, but it's still running and other people might see it. Um, so it kind of would have a life of its own after the fact, you know? And, and if you were lucky, you know, you got a photo, if you got some kind of documentation of it, you know, um, when, you, when that's taken out of the equation, for, for me personally anyway, it's kind of a, a major um, deterrent. I second that. It's just, yeah, but maybe that for the trains, but I mean, I think especially because we're dealing with so much shit in the city right now, that actually the persecution of young kids <laughs> making their marks on the wall is like pretty low priority right now. Yeah. And I'm seeing kind of more graffiti, more street art than ever before and like kind of bold places. So I feel like as a subculture, it seems relatively healthy with these kids. I don't know. What do you think, Henry? Yeah, from what I see, it's yeah, going on. It's going on. I, I don't know anything about it now. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's all, everything's past my bandwidth yeah. at this point. But. Yeah. I remember sitting, just going to the train to just watch the trains. Yeah, you sitting, did. Sitting on a bench and watching the different trains go by. There we go. And having favorites. Were you at 149? Yeah, that's, that's <laughs> the famous writer's bench. Yeah. Writer's bench. yeah, there was a writer's bench where literally all the artists would go and watch it. But I love that you were doing yeah, that. Yeah, St. Nick's. 149th and Grand Concourse. Yeah, but 149th in Amsterdam was sure. St. Nick's. Oh, oh. Uh -huh. Pretty uh -huh. cool place. Yeah. Brett, did you want to ask something? Yeah, I, I was just wondering if, you know, by 1980 or 81, the, you know, especially graffiti writers were starting to show in galleries, particularly in Europe, before the U.S. And I just wonder in terms of audience and how that might have shifted the work that was made 
uh, around that time once you, is, was there a trepidation or a danger in entering the commercial gallery system where as young kids a lot of times I think could have been easily exploited in, in terms of market values and how the work was uh, corralled in a sense or, or tamed, I'll, I'll use that word. Well, I mean for me it was a, a natural part of my evolution to start experimenting. So, I mean, perhaps I should have been more suspicious of pe other people, but for me, it was just kind of part of um, artistic growth, you know, and, uh, um, you know, really this is the, before Europe, it, this was really the first place that it was shown in a gallery scenario. And then it moved on to Europe somewhere in the mid, mid 1980s and their perspective of it was completely different um, than what was happening in America. In America, I think people tend to look at art in terms of a, a commercial perspective where, okay, you have art, like, w what does it do for me? You know, what, what are you selling with that? In, in Europe, people kind of grow up with it and it's accessible to everyone, you know, regardless of their social status. So they looked at what we were doing from a, a real different perspective. It was, it was like jazz, you know? I mean, jazz, bebop was looked down on here. Uh, when those guys got to Europe, you know, the they left. were treated like mm -hmm. superstars. They were treated like artists, is what I'm saying. Yeah. But if you really want to blow your mind, think of these paintings being done in 1964. Yeah, it's amazing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, you know, they're just phenomenally yeah. present. Yeah. Fresh. Yeah, they're fresh. so fresh. They look fresh, yeah. lively, and in your face. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I, I also wanted to just add something to what Days was saying, um, because to me that was maybe even a generational moment, uh, is that uh, part of my engagement was is that it wasn't just this incredible thing rolling through my world where like New York still felt black and white, and that was our moment of Technicolor when you'd see these trains. But Chris, uh, we, we mentioned some like Lee, Futura. There was a group of uh, artists who were, or, you know, back then no one called themselves a graffiti artist, they were writers, right? And then, and then they had to me like something I would call aspiration, that they actually right. wanted to be artists in dialogue with that amazing conversation that's been going on for quite a few centuries in Western art. And that was like a big shift. And, and of course there were things that enabled it along the way, but it was more like that it wasn't simply about getting your name up and getting all city anymore that like maybe, you know, maybe I could say something and maybe, you know, well, anyway, so. The Times Square show was essentially considered to be anonymous. Yeah. Like everyone showed there anonymously and it was a catalytic moment for all these characters, like to have cross paths. Yeah. You know, we don't amazing. know each other, but we cross paths. Yeah. But, and it was very exciting. A lot got coalesced, yeah. for sure. Yeah. It's and amazing. a lot came out of it afterwards. Yeah. Yeah. A lot did. That's yeah, really for sure. A lot. a lot. That was definitely um, like a one of the towards... seminal exhibitions that, that jump started a lot of things afterward. Yeah. And I mean, I kind of was a little too young for that, but maybe like a year or so. I but, was but, a little too but, old. But, but, like, <laughs> but like a year later, I was feeling the reproductions of that show because people were still talking about it. Right. I, I didn't go. I had nothing about it until after it happened, and I've always felt envious and jealous. And oh, come yeah, on, that's it's a tough one to miss. That's sort just of like another show. You know, just it, be sure to see Holbein. Okay. Like, yeah. I did. I did. Good. Yeah. Good. How are we doing? Should we do? Uh, should we do another question, or is it? How's everyone's attention span? Any questions? Let's do a couple more. <laughs> if anyone has any, otherwise we're good. All the way in back. Sorry, yeah, that'd be cool, man. Thanks. I, um, I'm coming from Europe. I'm not wondering if it's generational time. It was uh, all the artists, artists, they are working more as a manifesto. Then in those days, maybe you have uh, a distance gap between the community, like if you, if you so the way artists, like 
Was there a community? Is that what you're asking? Yes, I want to understand if, like, at the time, you would, like, making the action more like to a manifesto, so there's, like... Well, who wrote good manifestos for that? I don't think... I mean, <laughs> Ram LZ is the only what? guy I can think 1970? about. 1970? Yeah. There was, yeah. exactly. there was the, the, the newspaper. The uh, phase two, phase two, and David and Schmidlap, David Schmidlap, Schmidlap did, and that produced. was really beautiful organ of like mm -hmm. yeah, some real information. Yeah, it was called IGT with the, with the forbidden times. word. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. yeah there were, you know, I, it's interesting how these conversations happen because, of course, a lot of people are there were crews, but I think a lot of people were and, and as you say even for Times Square show there's a lot of like solitude and autonomy whether it's a studio practice or or doing work in public without permission um, so it took a while for these things to coalesce I think still does I think you know I, I always like to think that some towns I go to I meet all these cool people like oh they don't know all each other yet some crazy hot summer they're all going to get together and realize it's a town they hate it's really cool the thing about the Times Square show is it was like a, a clock like like a shift yeah and once it happened it was a new energy no, yeah. no uh, reverse and Diego followed that up pretty well with New York New Wave so that was kind of like but I mean I think the Times Square show got written up like at least two or three times in the New York Times it was sort of like the it was the hot thing in New York. I don't know how you slept through that one, Henry. Yeah, I did. I did. I'm sorry. It wasn't was just, in, it was wasn't just was, any old show. He was underground <laughs> taking photos. It's it. Yeah. Okay, yeah, anyone else? We good? Great, then. Thanks, everyone, for coming. Thank you, guys.